Hello. It is a long time I haven't posted a video on this channel. There are personal reasons as the last few months have been very difficult for me. And also the fact that uploading videos on YouTube takes quite a long time and time is something I don't have much of. But since I am now confined, things are a little bit different and I thought it might be worth giving it a go. And although I had thought I had finished properly with Wim Winters and the double beat theory, I realized that there were yet a little more than could be said on the subject. I have approached it on a musicological level to expose its fallacy. For the moment, I want to concentrate on the psychological aspect of things and examine a little more closely how this belief works out. What is the mindset of someone who adheres to the theory and how it bears relation to other conspiracy theories? From the beginning, I want to make clear that I approach this topic with the firm conviction that the theory is bogus. And in this video, I certainly will not try to convince people of this. It has been done time and time again here on YouTube, on Facebook and on other platforms. As far as I'm concerned, the fallacy has been exposed once and for all, unless some new stunning pieces of evidence come and overturn everything we know, which is vaguely possible, but very, very unlikely. Now, what interests me here is why, in spite of very solid counter evidence, some people adhere to the theory, how it plays out and what is the mindset behind it. Double beat theory has often been compared to flat earth and there is a lot to be said for the comparison. I have for a long time been fascinated by conspiracy theories and found it rather bewildering that the musical world could host something that so closely looks like one. On the surface of it, music or for that matter art of any kind should be the last place where this kind of thing might appear. Conspiracy theories distinguish themselves by a refusal to adhere to the so-called official version of events, whatever they may be. In doing this, believers in conspiracy theory have to imagine that people are hiding things from them, usually because they don't want to accept the mind-blowing consequences of the conspiracy theory. They usually regard themselves as a small elite group of people who knows better, are better informed, or more clever. They form small groups who propagate information among themselves, which is usually highly selective and usually ignores any attempt from outside source to straighten things. Any counterfacts will be ignored or distorted. Now, does any of this ring a bell to you? One has observed Wim Winter now for something like two or three years and seen evolution in his language, in his rhetoric, rhetoric in his tone, his general behavior, together with the one of his community. And it has been most interesting. When I say that music does not on the surface lend itself to conspiracy theory, I am correct. But musicology, of course, is a different thing, for it is a historical discipline and history is the fertile, fertile soil on which conspiracies grow. So maybe the surprise is that there are not, no more conspiracies. It is interesting to note the fact that experts on the subject say belief in conspiracy is something of a mindset and that one usually finds if someone believes in one, it is likely he will believe in another. In the case of Wim, one does observe this tendency to mistrust the opinion of experts and come up with alternative theories about other things, though in a much less intrusive way. A good example would be his attitude towards Anton Schiedler, widely discredited by musicologists as being something of a fantasist, but to whom Wim gives a lot of credit. Or even his attitude to Grace Nutt in the classical period exemplified in his recording of Mozart à la Turca. But the double beat 
is Wim's masterpiece and his claim to fame. Though he has not invented the theory, he has done more than anyone to spread it around and he is a master of internet communication. When Wim started his channel a few years back, he came across as a slightly awkward but genuine man who wanted to share enthusiasm and a certain view on music making. As the channel became more ideologically orientated, he had to deal with the inevitable backlash, criticism of his ideas, and he lost much of that softness that made him appealing at the beginning. This sense of mission and isolation created an inflation, which can now very clearly be observed in Wim and also in his followers. Like a cult, there is this sense that they stick together because they possess a truth that isolates them from the rest of the world and makes them superior because they know something that the rest of the world does not. There has been a definite change in Wim's attitude with his contradictors. As is well known now and by now, anyone criticizing his idea on his channel doesn't have long to live before he gets banned which makes the comment section of his recent videos mind-blowingly tedious to read. Now and then, a novice who yet doesn't know better arrives with legitimate questions, armed with his own innocence and goodwill, probably slightly surprised to see that he seems to be the only one wondering. The response from Wim is now downri downright condescending, sometimes sarcastic, always unpleasant. It is a long way from his beginnings when he used to be assailed by people contesting his ideas. He then had a few possible answers up his sleeves, not many, the star being the sempiternal Plague Shani Opus 291 with a metronome in single bit, which I'm sure made many of us scream in despair. But there was a certain goodwill in trying to engage in a discussion even if one had the sense that he would rather hang his own mother, mother than re renouncing his belief. Now he has ceased to engage with any contradiction whatsoever, and the tone employed in the description box of his most recent video is utterly cringe-inducing. They are self-aggrandizing to the point of absurdity, with the most pathetic premieres with most of the pathetic premieres of work played at high speed described as historical events of prime importance. And one might think that there is a certain irony in this, that it is done light-heartedly, but actually it is not. This is really what he believes. He has well and truly become the guru of a new cult, and he is really utterly convinced that he has a special mission which will make him unique and remembered from gener for generations to come. But to reach those heights cannot be done on one's strength alone. One has to make other people lower as well. This phenomenon brought forward an unfortunate side effect. Together with becoming harsh and unpleasant with contradictors, he has now extended that attitude towards musician playing normally. That is something genuinely new. Up to roughly a year ago, the general attitude could be summarized as, I believe this to be true, but this is music and there are many ways to make music to be enjoyed and it is all fine by me. So over the hard core of belief, there was an outer shell of tolerance. This has now gone. One of the recent self-promotion video overly mocked John Elliot Gardiner for tying with Beethoven's marking, and people who play at normal speeds are generally insulted. Virtuosity is looked at with utter contempt, as if playing more than six notes a second, to stick with the terminology of the whole bit, whole beat ideology, is regarded as an unmistakable sign that there is not a hint of musicality in your being. One can see a clear sign of this growing sense of inflation. 
in that he gets more and more disconnected from reality. Now, this might sound strange, a strange argument on my part, because I'm quite convinced that the whole double bit affair is nothing more than a fantasy in the first place. What I mean is a little more subtle. When Wim looks at Beethoven or Chopin, he at least tries to find a justification for his ideas by distorting original sources. And when you are that far back in time, you can at least entertain the illusion, which he certainly does, that there has been a dramatic shift in the middle of the century where everybody suddenly started playing much faster and somehow forgot how to read a metronome mark properly. But when you move forward in time to the later past of the century, you come across a serious problem, which is, of course, historical recording. Now, this is a subject of which Wim has always accepted that he knew very little about. One might think that if you are doing some research about tempo in the early 19th century, this was actually crucial. It is obvious that he prefers not digging too deep into the subject because he's very afraid of what he might find in it, namely strong pointers that he might be wrong after all. He instead always preferred cherry-picking the few recordings that seem to be in his favor and boldly ignore the rest. So when he starts to broadcast performances of work by Liszt, he's on very dodgy ground indeed, because we have many recordings by Liszt students. But with time, he gets bolder. He's now uploading Grig, which again, recording either by him or by his close friend Percy Granger entirely disprove. And he will no doubt try to creep further and further on. Debussy will be next, no doubt, and then we can look forward to Ligeti Etude in double beats before too long. And this be because he has now lost the tiny anchor which once used to bind him to some sort of reality. He has lost it because, like a really bad researcher, he is always looking for confirmation of his hypotheses. So he finds one historical recording a bit slower than the rest, and this will be the proof, the one person who still carries out the flame of the long lost tradition. He doesn't even consider that it could be and is much more likely to be the other way around. Everybody, everybody is playing normally and sometimes you get someone who might play slower, as in the Punyo Chopin recording, or sometimes faster, as the, all the Ilona Ebenschutz recording testify. And with all this, there is a last thing which is going by the board, and this one rather sad, that is his talent as a musician. Though, of course, this is only a personal opinion. Up to a few years ago, Wim was a musician who liked to play slowly. His first recording on, of classical and Baroque works on the clavichord were slow and very inauthentic, but they displayed qualities of musicianship which could make them compelling. I would even say at the very beginning of the mutation, when whole beat was still double beat, he also had a face where he could play interestingly. One of the only concerts on his channel has him playing Beethoven's Sixth Sonata at almost half speed, but by then, the inner fire of trying to convince the whole world generated an energy and a creativity that was not without merit. Today, Wim is not trying to convince the world. He's despising the world for not, merely, not more widely recognizing his greatness and his recent performances are overwhelmingly tedious to watch. There are a few tools in his performer's box, which used to be expressive tools and have become mannerisms, very successfully passed on to his young disciple. I will name but a few. The accordion-like rhythm, where the beginning of the beats are elongated and later parts, the latter part shortened. This is a good device to create the illusion of movement when the tempo dogma imposes such a dire statism. But he abuses it grossly and it has become a meaningless trick. 
which makes one seasick if listening for more than a minute. There are the arpeggiated chords, again buying in times, time when things get really too slow. The long poses to make one feel that he's so comfortable in these slow speeds that he can stretch time even more. And that is about it. His biggest downfall as a historical performer has always been his complete absence of differentiation in style. Even assuming that by an extraordinary stroke of luck, he got the style of even one composer right, he would still make the mistake of playing everything exactly with the same aesthetic, which contradicts everything we know about 18th and 19th century performance. There is not a shed of difference between the way he approaches Bach, Beethoven, Mozart or Chopin. The few aforementioned mannerisms are all he possesses, and he mindlessly applies them to everything he touches, churning out one manufactured performance after another. I suppose all the time involved in making two or three videos a week is also taking its toll on his practice routine. So half speed is convenient in that he reduces the number of hours needed to learn something new. His performances sound now like sight reading at half speed with a few trademarks thrown here and there to make it sound like Wim Winters. So where does all this leave him? For all his prophecies of a bright future, where he is going to lead humanity to a better place, and for all the flattering number of subscribers on his channel, the reality is still very bleak. Apart from a small core of supporters, always the same, Wim's video usually plateau at a few thousand views. One suspects many of those from people coming more than once, either to look at comments, or to write one, or to reply to one, and ones also suspect a significant portion of these views are from people simply curious or detractors just checking on him. The historically informed group on Facebook wants nothing to do with him. He is regarded with utter contempt by serious academics. He will find it impossible to publish his ideas in any serious review for the reason that they have already been discredited and that he is not bringing any new pieces of evidence which could have turned the table in his favour. He doesn't have a life as a concert musician, so YouTube is all he has, and one does sense a certain desperation that things are not going the way he would like, which may also explain why he is becoming more extreme. The problem, as we are all well aware, is that he has backed himself into a very tight corner, after pouring so much insult on people playing at normal speeds, or even worse, on people on music being played at normal speeds, he has cut all his bridges. He cannot ever go back on what he publicly disowned. He will have to live and die a whole beater, crushing pitilessly any doubt threatening to break the threshold of consciousness in the silence of the night. Have you ever wondered on the psychological position this leaves him? It is not enviable. He has effectively condemned himself to adhere to his own theory and to a life where all the vitality, the nerve, the energy is sucked out of music making. It is rather cruel irony that his long-awaited premiere of the Beethoven Fifths arrived roughly at the time of the Currency's new recording with his anima eterna, musica eterna. While the latter demonstrates with such phenomenal talent what can be achieved by taking Beethoven's metronome seriously, delivering a rendition that truly breaks new interpretative grounds, we have on the other side this plonking and plodding sluggish rendering which negates everything Beethoven was about. It is sad in itself. It is also sad that he is catching a few people in his nets. One might think, for example, that Alberto Sana would have been better off for never going onto YouTube. But I, for one, cannot deny a certain curiosity in seeing his channel evolve with time. 
Maybe in looking at the way other conspiracy theorists evolve over time, one might get an idea of where things might be heading. Conspiracy theorists are like viruses. They spread very efficiently through the internet. This one is not terribly contagious so far, but does great harm to the musicianship of the people it catches. As far as we know, at the moment, the remission rate is low once one has been hit. So it is better to develop one's critical thinking as a preventive measure. In this time of information and disinformation, this is the best way to safeguard one's intellectual immune system. Thanks for watching.